There's much to talk about. Let's get to our panel. Joining us from Houston is Francisco Minaldi, a leading scholar on the politics and economics in the oil industry in Latin America. He's currently a fellow in the Center for Energy Studies at Rice University's Baker Institute. Brian Scheid is with us here in Washington. He covers oil policy as a senior writer for S&P Global Platts. Carl Larry is a commodities market specialist with Thomson Reuters in New York. And Gaudat Bagat is a political science professor at National Defense University here in Washington, where he focuses on Middle East policy, oil politics, and energy security. Thank you to all of you for being with us. Gaudat, let's look at US energy oil production. Uh, there's some big forecasts on the table, one which says that by the end of next year, the United States will rival Russia's production of oil. Uh, what, in your view, um, has led to this increased production? Uh, I believe uh, at least two points, two factors uh, changing the energy landscape. One of them, uh, which is getting a lot of attention, uh, shell revolution, fracking, and uh, basically United States production is uh, <coughs> as uh, high as it was in 1970. Uh, this is great time for US oil production. The other factor which is not getting uh, enough credit, in my opinion, is very important, energy efficiency, less consumption. The Americans, the Europeans, the Chinese, many people around the world consume less oil. And because of this, there is more production, less consumption, and this is why oil prices are low and are likely to remain low for a long time. But again, I believe this is very important. It is not only production, but also uh, I work for Department of Defense. Uh, United States Department of Defense is consume, consuming much less oil than it used to be. U.S. Department of Defense is by far the largest oil consumer. What do you attribute that to the fact that the Department of Defense and other countries are using less energy? Uh, most important, uh, people care about the environment. And this is very important. M people around the world uh, see the pollution. They want clean air for themselves, their children. Uh, another factor is policy. Uh, countries do not want to be intimidated by oil producers. The less they consume, the less chances that they will be intimidated. Brian, increased oil production, what does that mean for domestic oil prices as well as for the economy in the United States? Well, I think you see prices hovering around the $60 range. They went up last week. There was some speculation they could make it to $80 a barrel. They've since come down a bit. Uh, I think that a lot of the expectations, such as the U.S. Energy Information Administration, feels they're going to hover right around this area, right around 60 And a lot of that has to do with the fact that there is such a supply gl glut on the market. And the U.S. has been able to manage that. U.S. producers, I'm sorry, have been able to manage that, um, mainly by these advancements in drilling technology, bringing their costs down, and things like that. So that's where prices are going to be. The U.S. has now moved away from this. The, these, these prices, this, this supply glut in the United States, has mo moved the U.S. away from this policy of saying, all right, now we have energy scarcity. And we need to look, how can we solve that problem? How can we get energy security? to this point where we're now talking about this idea of energy dominance. And that's what's done that a lot. And the big question of what happens with that policy is what happens with prices. When you say an energy glut, wouldn't that lead to prices falling? Potentially. I mean, that's what we're seeing now, is that, that US shale is ramping up so high that the prices are coming down. But one of the things that we're talking about, and the reasons, the reasons you have seen this glut uh, I'm sorry, you have seen these prices uh, come down is because of what OPEC and Russia have gotten together to do, to curtail their production. And that, in turn, has sort of balanced out the market a bit. We don't know what the long-term impact is going to be. and We don't know what the, the, the big you know, question mark is, what are, U, what are U.S. producers going to do in response to that curtailment? But right now, we're, having, we're seeing prices sort of come down again a little bit. Carl Larry, the outlook is rosy with uh, shale production, but can the U.S. sustain these high levels of shale production? What if oil prices fall? Well, I mean, you know, there's your supply and demand balance, but it, it comes from an economics you know, standpoint here. 
if prices to produce go higher, then our production is going to go lower. So, you know, it, they have to kind of balance that out. You know, no matter if the prices stay here or go higher, we have to watch where those prices go compared to where the services go or the production costs go. And technology is getting better, but it's still going to cost money. And, Cole, what about other variables like uh, the price of land where drilling takes place? Uh, are these costs rising? What about drilling technology? Well, technology is getting more efficient, that's for sure. But, you know, the big scare in the market right now is inflation. And that inflation really makes a difference when it comes to oil also. Uh, you know, we're, we're starting to see costs rise, whether it comes from, you know, from the service producers or the actual technology. And that's going to put a damper on these prices as they go higher until they can balance that out. Let's bring in Francisco. Francisco, uh, we heard a little bit at the beginning of the show in that report about uh, what this does for the United States in terms of its diplomacy, in terms of its foreign relations. But what are the economic and political ramifications uh, of the U.S. becoming a global oil producer? Well, I mean, in, in terms of the, the politics, it's uh, it, very interesting how it has already, you know, affected uh, uh, the world uh, uh, geopolitics. For example, it would have been unthinkable uh, that OPEC and, and Russia uh, will get together as they did. And, and that happened because of the, uh, the shale revolution uh, caused uh, a decline in the price of oil uh, in 2014 that was so dramatic uh, that uh, uh, affected uh, very significantly uh, all the uh, oil exporters in the world, and particularly OPEC members and, of course, uh, uh, Russia. And that led to a, a, an unlikely alliance between uh, Saudi Arabia and, and, and Russia uh, that we had, uh, you know, never expected. And, of course, as, as predicted, you know, once they uh, curtail uh, production, uh, the, the OPEC uh, quota uh, cuts uh, by uh, about 1.8 million barrels, the price went up, but then, you know, the shale producers started uh, drilling again. And now uh, they face the same tough choice that they had uh, fa uh, been facing before, which is, you know, if uh, basically by cutting production, what they will do is uh, uh, give a market uh, to U.S. oil producers, are they uh, actually gaining something? Because if the price goes down again, you know, they simply will get uh, less market share and, and, and the price will not go up uh, significantly. So, Francisco, then the United States is not held hostage to oil prices uh, simply by the fact that, as you've pointed out a moment ago, if the Saudi Arabians and uh, the Russians decide that they're going to cut production, then the U.S. just increases shale production. Yes, and, and of course, th th there is a big difference in the sense that the U.S. It does not decide to increase production, uh, I mean, in terms of the government deciding it. It's, it's uh, uh, individual companies uh, doing it because of the economics, the profitability of it. And so that's very different from what you see, you know, in Russia or in the OPEC countries in which the governments decide how much their countries uh, produce. Uh, but without a doubt, that gives the U.S., uh, uh, you know, a tremendous advantage and it changes a lot of the of the economics of it, because it used to be that the U.S. was, uh, you know, very worried when the price of oil uh, went uh, up because they were a, a massive net importer, whereas now, which is uh, the U.S. is uh, much less uh, significant uh, net importer, uh, they care more about uh, the economics in terms of the supply and how it benefits uh, oil production in the U.S. So, Gerard, when President Trump talks about uh, an energy dominance agenda, is that what he's referring to, the fact that it doesn't have to depend on these other countries. Uh, since uh, President Nixon, uh, all American presidents, with no exception, talked about energy security, oil security, uh, basically, the United States will not import any oil from uh, overseas in general, and especially from uh, the troubled Middle East. But uh, I believe it's, it is important not to overstate this, because it is true uh, American oil production is rising. It is true United States is less vulnerable to intimidation by oil producers. But also it is true that the global oil market is well integrated. Uh, China, India, other countries import a lot of oil from the Middle East. And uh, United States is the largest economy in the world. The uh, economic well-being of China, of India, uh, is important to United States. 
So it is true, United States uh, depends less on imported oil, but it is also true that the global oil market is well integrated. United States has uh, important interest in keeping oil supplies to India, to Japan, to China. Let me just jump in real quick when he's, he's pointing that out, is that the U.S. is still a major consumer right. of crude oil. You know, they're, they're going into record production. We're not pr producing more than 10 million barrels per day. We're still consuming 20 million barrels per day. You know, we're still importing. We're importing less, but we're still importing a relative a lot compared to the rest of the world. And I think you see something like a Davos. Where, and you show the, uh, the changing nature of our relationship with the rest of the world when it comes to oil. Uh, the, the Russian oil minister, the Saudi oil minister, and Rick Perry, the U.S. Uh, Secretary of Energy, are all sharing the same stage. The U.S. is no longer strictly a consumer of oil. They're no longer the, the U.S. is no longer just the customer to Saudi Arabia and to Russia, um, but they still are a customer. So this has given the U.S. more clout in international energy markets, right? Yeah, correct, yes.